Uh, welcome everybody to the session entitled uh, The Role of Decellularized Graft Materials in Biofilm Removal. This session in the uh, Optimizing Healing of Chronic Installed Wounds is uh, supported by an educational grant from uh, Triad Life Sciences. And uh, there are uh, two of us who will be talking to you today. Uh, myself, I'm Steve Badalak. I'm a professor of surgery at the University of Pittsburgh at the McGowan Institute for Regenerative Medicine. And following my presentation will be one by uh, Dr. Matt Pragulski, and I'll let uh, Matt introduce himself at the time. We've got um, a couple of disclosures that uh, must be made. I'm on advisory boards for uh, various um, uh, companies. Uh, and We've got, uh, other than the disclosures that you're going to see, I guess no others to uh, report. We've got learning objectives uh, for this session. Uh, the first two are learning objectives in my presentation, which are to understand the role of the innate immune system in normal wound healing and abnormal wound healing, and to evaluate the impact of a naturally occurring environment represented by the extracellular matrix in, in wound healing. Uh, there have been a lot of advancements in the past 25 years that uh, have the potential to impact, impact the practice of medicine. Just think about the, you know, it's really been less than 25 years ago when stem cell biology really took off. Nanotechnology has just developed at an incredible pace. 3D printing, gene editing, uh, AI, artificial intelligence, uh, and immunobiology, which is a, an area that I'm going to spend uh, quite a bit of uh, this presentation on because I think it's so critical in understanding not only current uh, methods for treating wounds and our, our relative shortcomings, but also the potential for improved wound healing over the next um, couple of years, decade, uh, or, or however long we can um, continue to make such advances. I'm going to assume that um, Many of you, but perhaps not all of you, uh, have understood the paradigm shift that's occurred in our understanding of the, the way we respond to injury, particularly with respect to macrophages. Macrophages, as you know, are a mononuclear inflammatory cell that originate <clears throat> mostly in the bone marrow, circulate as a monocyte, exit the vasculature into an area of need, an, an injury site, a chronic wound, for example, and then for at least for 100 years, we thought the role of the macrophage was to phagocytose cellular debris or uh, bacteria, other infectious agents, quote, clean up the debris, recruit fibroblasts, uh, and then um, close the wound with uh, some sort of a scar tissue uh, mediated by the collagen production from the fibroblast. Sometimes these macrophages would coalesce to form a multinuclear giant cell if what they were trying to respond to was non-degradable or too big to phagocytose. And that's everything that you see on the left-hand side of this screen. And that macrophage phenotype, the M0 is the, is the naive macrophage. The M1 macrophage is the pro-inflammatory phagocytic uh, macrophage that uh, we've known for so long. Uh, and then it gets activated by things like interferon gamma, uh, LPS, which is endotoxin and so forth. And then it turns into a cell that secretes a bunch of seek and destroy type of mediators, cytokines and chemokines and so forth. And it's got particular surface markers. And uh, this is what we've always known. In the late nineties, uh, this is where interdisciplinary, um, an understanding of interdisciplinary research really uh, comes to bear. The immunologists started asking questions about why tumors were surrounded by mononuclear cells, these macrophages, and yet continue to grow and actually proliferate. And the, um, as they looked more and more deeply into this, what they started to recognize was that these macrophages were not acting like the pro-inflammatory macrophages. In fact, they were becoming very permissive um, and they were turning into a permissive phenotype because of factors secreted likely by the tumor cells. And there, there was this entirely opposite phenotype of macrophages, and they gave it the name M2, 
Uh, and these cells look identical, which is why they were weren't recognized prior to this, but they secrete an entirely different profile of cytokines and chemokines that actually allow tumor cells to grow. Well, these cells, as we looked more and more into the phenotype of macrophages, what we understood or, or come to understand was the fact that it's not just one or the, the other, but it's actually a spectrum. These macrophages can exist as a one end of the spectrum pro-inflammatory phenotype, the opposite, the anti actually anti-inflammatory phenotype and everything in between. And that phenotype is dictated almost entirely by their microenvironment. And by microenvironment, I mean everything that contributes to the microenvironment, the um, molecules that are there, the mechanical forces, the oxygen concentration, probably a nutrient concentration and so forth, will, will dictate the phenotype of the macrophages, which in turn dictates the downstream outcomes. So for the past, at least 10, probably 15 years, uh, there has been a shift in uh, the biomaterials field, the regenerative medicine field, wound healing field, towards understanding the role of this phenotype and improving outcomes. How can we proactively uh, dictate what that macrophage phenotype is going to be like so that we can dictate the downstream outcomes? We did a study about 15 years ago in which we took uh, about 30 different biomaterials and the, the, these graphs only show about half of those, uh, the naturally occurring biomaterials, those that are made out of extracellular matrix or components of extracellular matrix for the most part. Um, and they were lined up from the uh, lowest bars to the highest bars in each of the graphs. Um, of course, that's not going to be alph alphabetical, but, but the bottom line was that we, we had an animal model, we looked at the macrophages, we, we, we characterized their phenotype and, and showed, uh, and, and then also uh, scored the histologic outcomes. Uh, and the histologic outcomes had a very low score uh, for many of these, you can see the low bars uh, that would have been on the left-hand side at both two weeks and at five weeks. And then uh, what we did then was to say, how do those histologic scores or those histomorphologic outcomes compare with the M2 to M1 ratio. How many of the, cell, the macrophages were in the anti-inflammatory versus pro-inflammatory phenotype? There's a very high correlation. And so we started to become pretty convinced that the macrophage phenotype was a predictor of the type of outcome you're, one was going to get when certain bio, when, when biomaterials were implanted for, for any of a variety of applications. So we then started to look at what was the difference between those uh, biomaterials, naturally occurring biomaterials that gave a low score versus a high score. <clears throat> and what we recognized was that those biomaterials that maintained the uh, structure and composition of the natural extracellular matrix, mother nature's version of the extracellular matrix gave the highest scores. So this, this is a, an image of, a, of the extracellular matrix. This uh, particular image happens to represent um, uh, the basement membrane and the underlying um, tunica propria of the urinary bladder of a pig. It's white because it has no cells in it. It's just the matrix. Uh, and if you understand what ACM represents, it's basically the, the products that are secreted by the cells of every um, um, tissue and organ. So every tissue and organ has a slightly different extracellular matrix. Uh, and whereas 25 years ago, we would have um, been very comfortable saying that the primary uh, function of the matrix was a mechanical one. In other words, provide support, strength, shape, and form to a tissue. We now understand that likely that, although that's an important function, is probably secondary. Uh, or at least no more than 50% because the matrix is loaded with signaling molecules that dramatically influence the behavior of the cells that are present within each tissue and organ. And we can isolate that extracellular matrix by various methods that remove the cells from the tissues. Every method uh, and every tissue has a different optimal method um, is different. And there's no way you can do this without without somewhat altering the, the, uh, the 
structure and composition, but the goal would be to keep it as close to normal as possible. I love this picture. This, this image was uh, provided uh, to me by Bob Meacham uh, in St. Louis, and it's the interface between the extracellular matrix at the top of the slide uh, and the cell itself. And the, the reason it's, I like it uh, so well is, is that it, is, it shows you this intimate relationship between the matrix and the cell. They're actually connected. So when you try to decellularize a tissue, that's virtually impossible to get rid of all of the cell uh, remnants that are there, but you, you wanna do your best. Otherwise you just end up with a extracellular matrix with a bunch of cell debris in it. And it turns into be a pro-inflammatory sort of a, a material. But this also shows how readily signals from the matrix enter the cell whether they're mechanical signals or molecular signals and vice versa. The cells then secrete the matrix. And so there's this constant cough to a crosstalk that was uh, given the, uh, the name dynamic reciprocity by Bornstein and Bissell uh, in the early eighties. And I think it's a very good uh, um, uh, descriptor of what's going on now. So what happens when you take an extracellular matrix and, and think of it as a micro environment and you want to influence wound healing. Um, we've learned uh, uh, so, some things that I'm 100% confident in telling you uh, that, uh, and are true. Uh, we've worked with this for a long time. There's several things we might suspect, but I'm only gonna tell you the things that are, are I'm 100% convinced of. Whatever is put at the wound site needs to be temporary. It needs to go away. Otherwise, the body's going to continue to respond to it. There's no such thing as an inert biomaterial. Body responds to everything you put there. So it's got to go away so that the body gets the signals or the information or whatever the, the reason for putting it was there. Uh, it, it does its job and then it leaves so that you're eventually you just have natural tissue. Secondly, in when you use the ECM as a, uh, a bio scaffold, uh, we'll use that term, uh, it degrades as the body responds to it, and the products of degradation then are released into the surrounding tissue. Well, with extracellular matrix, we've got all these signaling molecules, growth factors, chemokines, uh, you, you name it, they're there. And, and they influence the cells that uh, they, they come in contact with. So the degradation actually creates a more reactive site in a good way than the intact scaffold itself. One of the most important events that occurs is modulation of the innate immune system. It increases the M2 profile, and we'll talk about that more in just a minute. And, and lastly, some of these signaling molecules actually recruit endogenous stem cells to the site. That, that's, uh, that makes sense. I mean, if you think about this from a sort of a natural physiology standpoint, you get, an, you get tissue injury, um, the body responds to the injury, neutrophils, macrophages come into the site, but, and this doesn't matter whether we're talking about a superficial skin wound or a, uh, you know, a, a deep tissue wound. Um, these inflammatory cells get there, they release their proteolytic enzymes and other effectors, and they begin to not only um, destroy things like infectious agents, but also degrade the extracellular matrix. So the ECM then releases these signaling molecules, and this would be at sometime around two, three, four days post-injury, that, that now say, okay, enough's enough. It has it sort of an anti-inflammatory function to settle things down, and you now, in, otherwise you'd have nothing but chronic non-healing wounds if it was just a continuous pro-inflammatory environment. So the, the Signals released by the extracellular matrix actually calm the wound site, resolve it, and actually promote a wound healing environment, including the recruitment of endogenous stem cells. So uh, let's focus on the uh, uh, immunomodulation part. I just show this slide not for any reason other than, than to uh, illustrate that there are loads of articles. I mean, th this could be 10... 10 times as big if I wanted it to be, uh, that in literally every body system uh, on the left, the tissues, um, it's now recognized that this transition from an M1 to an M2 phenotype occurs as a function of normal wound healing. 
which kind of seems obvious in, in hindsight, right? Why didn't we recognize this a long time ago? Um, yeah, I'm not going to attempt to answer, <laughs> answer that. Uh, so let me, let me show you an experiment. So we um, isolate extracellular matrix from a lot of different tissues. We also isolate uh, mononuclear cells from the bone marrow of, of mice. And the marker of a, ma of a macrophage in a um, uh, mouse is F480. So you take these mononuclear cells, you isolate from the marrow, you put them in MCSF for a week with a couple of other goodies. They turn into macrophages. They show a, a macrophage phenotype. INOS is an indicator of a pro-inflammatory M1 type macrophage. FIS1 is a marker in the mouse for an M2 anti-inflammatory phenotype. We can take these cells, expose them to known activators of M1, uh, like LPS and ferron gammon, and they show both markers. We can alternatively expose them to IL-4, which is an anti-inflammatory activator. And so we, we've got our, our basically our controls. We can then take extracellular matrix from, let's say, a tissue like uh, small intestinal submucosa, SIS. Degrade it, expose the macrophages to it. They all go to an M2 phenotype. Let's take a uh, look at urinary bladder matrix or muscle matrix. They go to an N2 phenotype or brain or spinal cord or esophagus. They're all different degrees of activation, but none of them activate a pro-inflammatory phenotype. The message is the extracellular matrix contains signaling molecules that calm down inflammation and promote wound healing and an anti-inflammatory phenotype of the cells such as macrophage that come into the wound site. And the, um, in addition to the immunomodulation that occurs, one of the other interesting uh, uh, things that happens relevant to the second half of this presentation by Dr. Rogulski <clears throat> is that there is an upregulation of the production of antimicrobial uh, peptides. We, you, you may know, you likely know, that we have naturally occurring AMPs, antimicrobial peptides, that are part of one of our very earliest defense systems. They've been around for eons. And uh, we were working with another naturally occurring material uh, uh, called uh, Phasix, uh, a poly-4-hydroxybutyrate. Uh, uh, it was a naturally occurring molecule. And learned that when macrophages were exposed to them, the, uh, and, and this work was done by a, a terrific uh, graduate student and then postdoc in my lab, uh, Catalina, uh, who not only identified the receptor for the 4-hydroxybutyrate, but the intracellular pathway that resulted in an upregulation of, of cathelicidins, which are one of the types of antimicrobial peptides. And there, the other types are upregulated as well. So the reason I, I'm going through this and relatively quickly, I apologize for that, but hopefully we can address some in the um, Q&A session, is that the matrix is loaded with uh, signaling molecules that if you were designing a biomaterial to try to say, I want positive immunoregulation, I want an antimicrobial effect and so forth, it's loaded with these things naturally. And if you prepare a matrix from ECM, and can think of it as a microenvironment, you can then basically orchestrate by placing it at the wound site, the release of these uh, particular um, signaling molecules and influence outcome. It also implies something that I haven't really stressed, but should be important is that the decellularization of the tissue from which the extracellular matrix is made becomes critical. Because if you just leave a lot of cellular debris in there, basically what you're the, then is leaving a mixture of pro-inflammatory signals and anti-inflammatory signals. You got to do your best to get rid of as, as much of the cellular debris as possible. Now, from a wound healing standpoint, <clears throat> what, what is, is interest, uh, I think, optimal is that you can take, say, a sheet of ECM uh, from whatever tissue you, know, you're, uh, you like, uh, you can turn it into a powder, you can turn it into a, a hydrogel, uh, which, which really becomes uh, quite nice because it's a liquid at room temperature and it turns into a gel at body temperature. You can like basically pour it onto a wound and it fills in all the nooks and crannies, sits there and it's already partially degraded since it's 
the, the, the gel form, and it releases these signaling molecules into the wound site and influences things that we, that we just talked about. So it, it basically is a collection of ECM degradation products. Um, there are, there's one uh, more thing that I, I wanna talk about. I'm gonna leave this slide because I'm sure that Dr. Rogulski is going to talk more about slime and biofilms and all of those good things. And, and uh, I'm gonna focus on um, one, one other uh, approach. Uh, and that is one of the signaling molecules within the um, extracellular matrix. And this is in all matrices. Now, there are lots of extracellular matrices for wound care. Um, amniotic uh, extracellular matrix is, is a particularly effective uh, extracellular matrix be because of the natural composition of the amnion and its role in life. Now, I, 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 um, I'm not gonna delve into that any further, but it, it, we're happy to talk about it in, again uh, in the Q&A session. If you think about diagrammatically, this is the extracellular matrix, the red um, squiggles represent collagen fibers and other structural proteins. And then there's all, of, all sorts of other um, uh, bioactive proteins in there as well. And they, they, they represent a variety of ligands, cytokines, growth factors, the different structural molecules, and then these cryptic peptides that get generated as the, as the, as the scaffold gets broken down. About four years ago, we had, we, uh, I had a postdoctoral student uh, named Luai Hulahail, who, who uh, asked, uh, who, whose project was to determine whether or not the equivalent of exosomes exist within the extracellular matrix. Exosomes are nano-sized lipid-bound particles that are found in all body fluids, and they contain a bunch of different information. So the question is, well, did these same types of vesicles, nanovesicles, occur in the matrix? And the answer is yes. Uh, we, we actually call them matrix-bound nanovesicles. And the question was, are they just simply trapped exosomes, or are they truly different? Well, it, as it turns out, they're distinctly different. They have a different lipid um, capsule. They have a different cargo within their lumen. Their, their cargo consists of microRNA and proteins that... Uh, represent signaling molecules that do exactly what we've been talking about. Immunomodulation to an M2 phenotype, stem cell recruitment, differentiation, uh, and, and, and events related to constructive um, tissue remodeling. So here's a component of the extracellular matrix that can affect the same thing as the ECM itself. The app, this would expand the clinical applications because you can use different carriers for it. You can it's a, obviously put it in very small volumes and inject it into sites that you couldn't put a solid piece of extracellular matrix into. Uh, we've con, uh, published several studies now showing you know, that we can simulate the uh, same type of macrophage phenotype simply by exposing cells to the uh, MBV that we do to, um, at, to the entire matrix itself. So, um, these antimicrobial peptides that we've been talking about are of particular interest in chronic wounds, particularly those that harbor a uh, particular um, pathogens, uh, cathelicidins, defensins, and so forth. And uh, the studies that we've done to um, show the upregulation of these macro uh, of these AMPs, the macrophages, uh, occurs when we expose macrophages to the degradation products or the um, uh, matrix-bound nanovesicles that are that are components uh, of the ECM, and I'll let you look at the uh, the results for yourself. But the, the bottom line is that every tissue uh, uh, ECM causes these events to to happen. Some with a little bit more potency than others, but basically they're all very proactive, bioactive wound dressings, if you will. Uh, and that uh, I'm, I'm sure that Dr. Rogulski is going to uh, elaborate upon. So bottom line, mother nature's version of the microenvironment, which in large part is the extracellular matrix, uh, is basically a controlled release material that 
is replete with signaling molecules that can not only modulate the immune system, but also um, promote an antimicrobial uh, environment. I wanna thank you for your attention. Uh, this uh, virtual presentation is a little bit uh, weird for me. This is the first one I've done. Um, I much prefer to interact with audiences face to face, but hopefully we'll get a chance to do that in the Q&A session. So uh, appreciate your attention. Thank you, Dr. Badalek. That was a fantastic presentation. I'm Dr. Matthew Rogolsky, and I thank you for this opportunity for me to present on this really exciting technology that can help all of us do better jobs for our patients. I am the medical director for the Wound Institute of Ocean County and senior partner in Ocean County Foot and Ankle Surgical Associates here in Toms River, New Jersey. This is my disclosures, but I have nothing to disclose for this lecture. Infection is gonna be a serious concern for us now, and of course, in the future. When we look at the amount of antibiotic resistant bacteria and fungus that we are seeing every day in our practices, the morbidity that's associated with treating these uh, types of problems that you and I encounter every day. And I think it's important for us to understand that all chronic infections are going to have, as we can see here, um, have significant amount of biofilm. And what is biofilm? How does it work? How does it protect the underlying pathogens? And how does it prevent treatment, both internal and external? But the point being that with antimicrobial resistance emerging, every 11 seconds in this country, according to the CDC, an antimicrobial infection occurs in the human population. So we need to have to deal with that effectively and have treatments that will prevent the reformation of that. The money that we're spending is quite significant. When we look at the cost of treating diabetes and its related complications, uh, we're talking hundreds of billions of dollars for that treatment. And when we put that, look at that in the context, the latest numbers we have was 3% of our GDP in, went for the treatment of diabetes and its related complications in 2018. So not only is this infectious process becoming more virulent that we have to deal with, but the costs are becoming exorbitant. I think it's important that we understand the chronic wound market that we're dealing with. We're looking at $100 billion that are being spent in the treatment of chronic wounds. When we start talking about particularly venous leg ulcerations, where one to 3% of the population over 65 has a venous leg ulceration. When we look at 25 to 35 million diabetics and 20 to 25% of them are going to have a diabetic foot ulcer. We have 90 million pre-diabetics waiting in the wings to develop these problems caused by chronic inflammation and multifactorial problems, obviously, but the money that we're spending is becoming astronomical. So we need to find concrete methods of dealing with this problem, but also at the same time being cost effective in its eradication. I think it's important for us to understand too how uh, that these hospital systems or when we have to readmit patients that have these types of uh, surgical site infections after doing surgical procedures. And I know that obviously that with uh, my patient population and your patient population, we do surgery on limb salvage patients that certainly they develop postoperative dehiscence as a combination of the multifactorial problems that they have with healing and the diabetic population in general that we just reviewed in the previous lecture on uh, cell migration and cell function that is being dampened and hampered by the chronic inflammatory and cellular senescence problem that diabetes engenders our patients, but does chronic inflammation in general. And hospitals now have to pay keen attention to that because they are uh, being penalized for that and having to give back money uh, for those admissions. So I think it's important that we have these proven therapies for dealing with this complex problem. Antimicrobial resistance, as I talked about, that every 11 seconds in the United States, there's, there's a, uh, an antimicrobial resistant infection, a person suffers from that. And it's very interesting about the CDC in 2018 that says every 15 minutes in the United States, somebody dies from an antibio re antibiotic resistant infection. So with the, the problems that we have with, with the bacteria infiltrating these areas and in chronic wounds in general, remember that we have 10 trillion bacteria on our skin, that's about 2 million bacteria per square centimeter on your body. You have 100 trillion bacteria 
in your gut as it is right now that aids in a multitude of processes, we can see that these antimicrobial resistant infections are gonna be the, the leader in this mortality and morbidity range. We think about all of our patients that have chronic wounds, how many rounds of antibiotics have they been given when there is no proof that antibiotics heal wounds? And it's important for us to understand that with, with CMS and with Medicare going on, that when we start to look at the chronic wound environment, we know that biofilm is gonna be present in 95% of these problems. We know that biofilm is a leading cause of chronic inflammation. We know that biofilm is going to be a leading stimulator of the cellular, cellular senescence uh, uh, pathology, which then leads to poor cell migration and causing cells to become pro-inflammatory that we have seen so eloquently put forth by Dr. Badalak. So we need to understand that problem and then we need to identify treatments that are gonna be able to handle these problems because we need to reduce the longevity, which will reduce the cost of these and improve the morbidity and mortality. So when we think about the normal wound healing continuum that is going on, right, we understand uh, the hemostasis, the inflammation, the proliferation, and the remodeling, and the, di and the diabetic, that process is slowed by this chronic inflammation engendering cellular senescence. And we know that diabetics take longer to heal because of the problems induced inside uh, their cells, the problems that cause their cells to be pro-inflammatory, kicking out more of those pro-inflammatory cytokine chemokine and growth factors. But at the same time, when that biofilm comes along and it creates this stuck in the inflammatory phase of wound healing, how do we get it out of that and how do we progress into that proliferative phase? I think it's important for us to understand that, that the normal wound healing physiology, we, we, we are stuck in the inflammatory phase. And I often wondered that when I became uh, into practice and I always wondered, what does that mean? when it's stuck in inflammation, can anybody present that to me eloquently so that I can understand why that is? And, and that's one of the features that biofilm is going to be causing uh, not only chronic wounds, but when you have chronic infections in general are going to be uh, characterized by this, by this uh, uh, biofilm, um, chronic inflammatory nidus that is going on. How do we get out of that and how do we progress into more proliferation is going to be the key problem. And because when we talk about biofilm, we know, understand that the cells that are in there uh, are pro-inflammatory, growth factor receptors are ripped off by the chronic inflammation. You have tremendous amounts of hypoxia that's going on. It's, the immune cells are being recruited to the area caused by um, particular uh, receptors on their cells and, and stimulated by these pathogen components of both bacteria and fungi and probably even viruses that we that are embedded in that as well. And so it's very difficult, the immune cells to come down and it's very difficult for them to break through a biofilm because it's quite impervious to those cytotoxic chemicals that are released through the oxidative burst in the inflammatory channel. So that's why when we talk about uh, wounds being stuck in that inflammatory phase, when we have these characteristics, how can we remove that barrier to healing? And obviously, we talk about these different types of, of factors that are going on. And all chronic wounds are hypoxic. That's why we don't have collagen synthesis, angiogenesis, resistance to infection, or epithelialization that is occurring. So that's what we talk about when that hypoxic cascade comes on, because the, the bacteria within the wound will consume are the molecular oxygen. But also, don't forget, your immune cells that are constantly stimulated by that nidus of the pathogenic material now they're consuming the molecular oxygen because they use that as their oxidative burst to release reactive oxygen species to destroy uh, the bacteria, the fungi that are in the wound. So they consume that as well. And then obviously there's a multitude of intrinsic factors that go on patients that have severe PVD, smokers, maybe they're on steroids, they have chemotherapy, radiation, um, obesity, medications that they're on, what's their nutritional status like, how is their protein levels going on? A lot of different uh, in, intrinsic factors in the patient that also can lead to poor healing. But when we talk about all of these, obviously, when you look at the slough and you can see the sequelae of biofilm, can we see it in, can we actually see it and touch it? That's very difficult to do that. But that slough, the, that necrotic yellow tissue that you see going on there is the sequelae of the chronic inflammatory destruction of the extracellular matrix. I think it's fascinating when we talk about biofilm that it's when we say, can you see it? Can you not see it? It's very difficult 
to see what is beneath uh, that, that wound surface. Obviously, there's this planktonic bacteria that we talk about, the freely floating bacteria that's in there, metabolically active, dividing bacteria. So when you take a swab of a wound and you just run it across there and you send it for phenotypic culturing, this is what you are predominantly picking up. Because when you look below that surface of this metabolically active and dividing bacteria, now we come into the, the bulk of the problem, which is our biofilm bacteria, stationary phase of growth. They're not actively replicating. Think of them as being very quiet and quiescent, encased inside this big sugar molecule because they feel protected. And the biofilm can be thousands and thousands of times resistant to antibiotics, oral, and of course, uh, uh, also to IVs. So it's very important that we understand what the structure of this biofilm and how to attack it and how do we defeat that. But biofilms can form very quickly, but it needs something to attach to, to start off in its sessile uh, formation for it to adhere. So the planktonic bacteria will come in, they adhere, these valleys to these ridges within the wound bed. Um, if we put an implant in, or if we put some type of foreign material to them, it's something for them to adhere to. And then they start to grow. They start to uh, spin the sugar around themselves because they start talking to each other, which we call quorum sensing that is going on. And as they start to transmit that material back and forth, they can upregulate genes that can increase their virulence and start secreting uh, these types of sugars to encase themselves in there to protect themselves from the external environment, from our immune system, from antibiotics, from the environment. It's a protective mechanism for these bacteria. And then eventually, as they start to grow out of the space, then they can release proteases and cause portions of their biofilm fully formed, then to break off and to be able to travel and seed other parts of the body. I often wondered about the inflammation, how long does it take for bacteria to, to adhere, to start, to grow, to start secreting its pro-inflammatory uh, molecules that it does of all those different categories. How fast when a patient gets injured, do they get a cut? Do they get an abrasion? Do they get a blister? Do they have a callus that cracks open? Do they bang their leg against the side rail of their bed at night? Or they were uh, getting in and out of the car and the door hit that and the and then as they start to have those characteristic signs of inflammation, how long does it take before it kind of quiesces that inflammation into a chronic state? And so as this starts to occur, what are these things that are going on? And I understand that some people argue about the time that it takes to get, become a true chronic wound. Some people think three weeks, four weeks. I think the most important thing that we have to look at is what is occurring within that molecular environment. Uh, how does the inflammation, instead of acute inflammation, which is necessary, the immune system is necessary for proper healing. Obviously, in the chronic inflammatory state, it, it becomes continuous. It's not signaled to turn off. Cells don't become apoptotic because senescent cells are resistant to apoptosis. So when they are resistant to that, they continue with their inflammatory cascade that is going on, and they're producing all of these different types of uh, cytotoxic uh, chemicals that can break down the ECM, but at the same time then are triggering our immune system to come down and together, both of those then are perpetuating the chronic inflammatory cascade. And when we have that chronic inflammation that's going down in there, it breaks down the extracellular matrix, allows wound fluid to percolate up into it in which these different types of species contained within the biofilm survive. And that's what they feed off that wound fluid, that exudate that is coming up through that tissue as it's being broken down by the chronic inflammation. So I think that it's fascinating for us and we need to understand that because that's how we are going to defeat it by understanding how this works and how it's produced. So this was a, a, an interesting slide about how bacteria itself can trigger multiple pathways to stimulating this pro-inflammatory cascade. And this is what we call inflammogen. Um, this is called the inflammasome activation. Certainly there is a conical pathway that occurs when certain types of bacteria can trigger uh, receptors on the surface of cells, such as the toll-like receptor here, the conical pathway stimulating NF-kappa-beta. But also at the same time is that components of our bacteria as well, through signal number two, it, that is called the, the LERP3 
inflammasome. This is inflammaging that occurs. This occurs in all cells. And this is how chronic inflammatory states, diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, neurodegeneration as well, chronic inflammatory states. And by signaling these, they produce this really nasty, the, the, the go-getter, if you will, for the stimulation of inflammatory cascade, interleukin-1 beta, which you're all familiar with, and interleukin-18, and how they can stimulate further downstream cascade, proteases, MMPs, cathepsins, things of that nature, downstream effect of these proteases that are being produced. So one bacteria can stimulate three different pathways within a cell producing inflammatory mediators. And it's the same thing with fungus. We're finding a lot with DNA testing. We're seeing different types of fungus that are being produced that are refined in fungal biofilms. And fungal biofilms are very difficult to eradicate because of the spore formation. But if you notice, when we talk about these different features of fungus, these different residues of the fungal wall components can trigger the conical pathway of nuclear factor kappa beta, which is the master regulator of inflammation, immunity, apoptosis, and if kappa beta can control the transcription of over 125 pro-inflammatory genes. So fungus is also becoming a significant problem, and there's multiple resistant fungus that are out there now, according to the CDC, very nasty to treat. And how does biofilm then, what does it do? Again, it's a structure that is going to protect the, these bacteria and fungus, these pathogens. It's going to be encasing them, keeping them safe, giving them a feeling of comfortability, being highly resistant to your immune response, being highly resistant to uh, antibiotics that we take both orally and IV because it's very difficult to get the concentration high enough, to get the flow rates high enough out of the plasma antibiotics to get through uh, a biofilm formation without destroying a patient's um, kidney. So this is one of the difficulties that we have of dealing with that is how do, can we get through this and prevent it from coming back? This is one of the first images that we see um, of a total hip implant. Uh, one of the first recorded images of uh, biofilm, this was a staph aureus biofilm. You can see the clustering like grapes that we see indicative of staph. And um, even if we could see a deeper electron microscopy to, to distinguish different types of, of bacteria there, but you can see how virulent, how, how grown this biofilm was. This is from the, 19, uh, the late 1980s. And you could see that how demonstrably quick it grows because it has a surface to attach to, and then by attaching to the surface, it can start to grow and produce the EPS that is around that and, and flourish uh, by attaching to these different types of, of materials. This is a really neat picture showing this is another Staph aureus biofilm that is forming, and look how fast that it starts to form. So these are these little tentacles of fibrinogen that are being produced by Staph, and how it can incorporate itself into this, into the EPS and this net-like structure, protecting it from the immune system, protecting it from antibiotic, but protecting it from the external environment. So even though we know one of the best ways we can defeat a biofilm is to debride, but we also need something to continually destroy that and prevent the reformation because you can see how fast that it can grow. It can literally, not only in five minutes, but it can be fully mature up to five hours now that there are some new reports showing that, but fully virulent in 24 hours. So what is actually occurring, what is going on in this, in this uh, the structure of the biofilm? And so when we start to understand the, the different types of things that it does uh, make and different types of enzymes that the biofilm make to defeat the cellular uh, constructs that are attacking that, the different types of proteases that it can produce so that it can break down and travel fully formed uh, pieces of the biofilm so it can seed other parts of, of the body. I think that it's fascinating how it can affect uh, our immune system cells and the different types of enzymes that it can produce as well to protect itself, but also being able to seed other parts of the human body. This is a very good picture. This is looking at a pseudomonas biofilm in somebody that has cystic fibrosis. And this is what we talk about pseudomonas, very nasty bacteria. We see a lot of that in the chronic wound field. Um, they're becoming very multi-drug resistant, very nasty to take care of. Um, and it's a great picture showing these are neutrophils, which are, think of neutrophils as the wolves of your immune system. 
They're the first responders that is going on uh, at in a type of injury or an infection. But pseudomonas then can secrete different types of alginates, different types of ramnolipids, different types of exoenzymes, very virulent things that can rip apart neutrophils, take off receptors on them, uh, cause them to lice, cause them to, uh, to burst, and preventing them from reaching deep inside and digesting the biofilm. I think that's a fascinating picture for that, so we can kind of understand the virulence that we're dealing with. This is also uh, macrophage is trying to get through a pseudomonas biofilm. And think of the macrophage as the lion of the immune system. It not only destroys pathogens, but then it can have it, obviously a conversion that we talked about in the previous eloquent slides about how then it starts to secrete anti-inflammatory proteins, growth factors, things to aid significantly in that wound healing paradigm. But as we look at these large macrophages trying to get through this filthy, nasty, slimy biofilm, they're tremendously outnumbered in both strength and, and secretory capability, but they're continuing trying to break through that, releasing hydrolytic enzymes that's not able to penetrate biofilm, but can uh, start to destroy the surrounding extracellular matrix as well, perpetuating the chronic inflammatory phenotype. So what do you think about how are we going to start breaking down biofilm? Debridement is one of the easiest things that we can do. That's why we need to debride wounds, obviously, once we know the vascular status of these patients. Um, but we can start to debride one of the simple, easiest things, sharp debridement, whether you're using a blade. I prefer a blade over a curette. I don't have to press as hard. It's a finer cut, less pain for the patient, perhaps. But as we can start to break down and debride away, all that sluffy necrotic material is one of the simplest ways that we can start to to defeat it. But how do we keep it from coming back? How do we destroy those pathogens inside? And again, preventing the reformation is going to be the key part. There's multiple therapies that are out there, multiple topical solutions out there. There's a lot of topical solutions that can destroy a biofilm, but at the same time, destroy your good tissue. So how do we be able to marry the two of non-toxicity, but not having resistance and knocking out all the different pathogens that are in there? And so you can see a lot of these uh, washes that you are familiar with, that you have used, do not break down the crosslinks in the EPS and very difficult to kill the sessile bacteria that is present. One thing I want you to understand is about when, when people talk about that they have efficacy against biofilm, a real quick thing is to ask them what kind of biofilm model they used. When next, when we, uh, the torrent was developed that we're talking about, it was done on, on 72 hour old biofilms that had flow to them. So you're talking about drip flow reactors, the CDC uh, bioreactors, they have flow moving through them. And when you can use flow through it, you make more virulent uh, biofilms because they have more nutrition, but at the same time, very difficult biofilms to get rid of because as the flow moves, it washes out what you're trying to test, the antimicrobial or a topical cleanser, things of that nature, it makes it very difficult. So you wanna see something that has flow and is very old, 72 hour old, biofilms because they're very virulent, very mature, very developed. So as we start to look at what's going on with these different types of solutions that are in there, yes, you may look at it and say, well, bovidone iodine destroyed um, the biofilm that was there. Well, we don't use full strength beta-9 ones because it's toxic. This is 10% concentration, incredibly toxic uh, to healing cells. But obviously, when you look at this, that these a lot of these common everyday things that you think can have an effect upon biofilm, do not really show significant efficacy. And when we start, start to look at utilizing this on, uh, on porcine tissue, when we start to have some kind of uh, event that we can look at these different structures that are going on, negative pressure, do you put negative pressure with, with the installation of things, um, hypochlorous acid washes really do not have a significant effect upon biofilm because the treatment of biofilm is a multimodal therapy. There's a multiple attack areas that you have to be able to knock out in order to prevent that reformation. And I think that's what's very elegant about this X-Biotechnology is that it has multitude of actions, a multimodal therapy to utilize. And it's, it's very elegant that is going on in here. Um, this is nothing earth shattering about the ingredients, but using them in the right concentration to affect the right change that is needed. Benzoquinone chloride, which is a, a cationic surfactant, 
We have citric acid and the sodium citrate, which lower the pH, they buffer the solution. This is what coats the sugar to prevent the reforming of it. And the ethanol is the solvent, so we can dilute out those solutes that are present uh, within the biofilm. Elegant chemistry to effect a, a multifactorial problem and defeat one of the major pillars of non-healing. The torrent, again, we test on three-day-old biofilm so that you can see the torrent X, Staph aureus, Pseudomonas, multi-species biofilm, 72-year-old trip flow reactors that uh, have very nasty, virulent, mature, very nutritionalized biofilms in there. So therefore, highly resistant to the treatments going on in there. And so you look at Prontosin and Vosh, which is a hypochlorous acid solution, orders of magnitude better. Remember, when we talk about log reduction, 10 to the first, that's 10 times better. 10 to the second power is, is 100 times better. 10 to the third, 1,000 times better. 10 to the fourth, 10,000 times better, and so on. So when we talk about agni uh, magnitudes of, of order better, log reductions that can be 10,000 times better than those treatments that you see when you use Torndex. Obviously, what we're talking about when we use Torrent X and Blast X is the cream version that has a capability to last three to four days after application. Torrent X is applied for 20 seconds. It's a stream. You squirt it onto the wound, debris. You can squirt a little bit more. It helps to loosen tissue and wash this tissue away, but at the same time, having a tremendous penetrating and killing power without harming good tissue and without harming good cells. And when you incorporate it with Blast X on top of that, um, I mean, you can see orders of magnitude better than the control group. It's very interesting to see that these different topical treatments and dressings. Again, when we, when we start talking about biofilm, we have to have something that can deconstruct uh, the biofilm itself, unzipping the biofilm for those, then swelling that bacteria that is in there and fungus that's there as well, blowing them apart, but again, uh, very important, preventing the reforming of the biofilm and therefore continuing with its virulence. So it's very important that we have to understand all these different types of topicals that are out there that cannot penetrate through biofilm, cannot prevent reformation. Are they harming the good tissue? Do they have an effect upon healing cells that are there? And then do we have something that can prevent um, not only the reformation, but also reduce resistance of what is occurring in this area? I think that is one of the one of the interesting things about um, uh, about the treatment of biofilm is that this is not an antibiotic using Tornax. We don't have to worry about um, resistance to these because we know biofilm is full of uh, different types of gram positive, gram negative bacteria, fungi. I wouldn't be surprised if we see some types of viral particles within the chronic wound. But we see on DNA these different types of bacteria, the amounts of those, the, the fungus that is becoming resistance to that. We have to find a way, again, to get through the EPS, deconstruct that EPS, blow apart the bacteria, and again, preventing the reformation of that biofilm is key. I don't know anything out there except for this X biotechnology that can prevent the reforming of that at significant orders of magnitude better than other treatments. When we start to understand these different treatments that we have, again, being the capability of non-toxicity, it's not cytotoxic to the healing tissue, to the cells that are present in there, and at the same time, having no chance for any type of antimicrobial resistance to it, because it's like artillery that is bombing through the EPS, that is blowing apart bacterial and fungal membranes, but again, more importantly, is that it's going to be preventing the reforming. I'm not saying we're gonna put this on everything and everybody's gonna do great. You still have to do all the good things that you were taught to do. You need to debride, you have to absorb drainage, and you put your mitigating inflammation, you're destroying those pathogens that are causing the chronic inflammation that is present. So I think that it's very important that we must understand we still have to do all of those good things that we have been taught to do for the treatment of chronic wounds. This is a serious threat as high morbidity, high mortality, extremely expensive to treat. And it's only getting worse. The number of, di of diabetics and pre-diabetics are growing out of control by the year 2030. We're looking at 800 million diabetics within the world. 
um, probably three or four times that in pre-diabetic people that are coming on. The cost and, of course, the mortality rates. Diabetic foot ulcer, 47% mortality rate. Venous leg ulcers, upwards of 29%, all cause mortality and chronic wounds in general. So we still have to do all of those good things that we have been taught to do. We have to stop looking at the hole in the patient, and we have to look at the whole patient. And we have to understand how blood flow plays a part, how the neuropathy plays a part, the biomechanical deformities are going, the nutrition, the smoking of the patient, um, what is their, their weight like, how obese they are, do they have other ailments or chronic kidney disease, cardiovascular disease, diabetes affecting every system in the body. So we have to, again, do all those good things they were taught to do. But if we don't start and treat the biofilm, the night is for that chronic inflammation, which is really the, what the biofilm does, obviously, destroying tissue through that chronic inflammatory stimulation. How would we expect to move on into the proliferative phase? If we don't destroy the biofilm, we could put $50,000 worth of stem cell grafting onto a wound. Are we going to be able to affect a, an epithelialization? Most likely not. It's a multifactorial problem, but one of the greatest factors in the treatment of, of and sustainability of chronic wounds is we have to knock out the chronic inflammation. Why is it stuck in the inflammatory phase? Uh, and that's perpetrated through your biofilm formation. So it's important to understand the Tornex with that particular elegant chemistry that goes on where it's able to depart. It takes those polymers and the EPS pulls them out into solution through the sodium citrate, the citric acid, buffering that pH down to penzoconium chloride is going to come in. It's going to bind to that membrane and bore a hole through the bacteria and the fungus that is in there, both resistant and, and planktonic and biofilm bacteria. And then with that sodium citrate that's there, it is binding to those ends of the sugar polymers and preventing the recurrence. I think that's one of the greatest features about this elegant technology is that it prevents the reforming of the biofilm itself. So when we're looking at options, how to treat the biofilm, we have non-toxic, there's no resistance to it, and it negates, it knocks out all those pathogens that are in the wound in a company with good debridement and all of those good things that we have been taught to do for, with all of these together, then we'll have a much better fighting chance at healing uh, wounds that have significant mortality, uh, a lot more uh, than the other uh, ailments out there, particularly in cancer and and other causes of death. So this is important that you understand the science behind it. What can you avail yourself of, of being able to treat this entity without harming good tissue, but getting rid of these pathogens and moving on into a more proliferative phase to achieve your epithelialization. That's where we come in with the X-Bio technology.